Okay, now, so if we turn to formal methods, uh, of course, everyone's, uh, everyone refers to Wikipedia as a definition, and this definition is a bit dry, I have to say, so I won't, won't bother reading it out, I'll let you, do, let you read it to yourself. But um, the idea I want to say that there's, uh, there's some key words in there, uh, formal languages, logic, uh, theory, semantics, I mean, it's, it's, it's a completely different way of developing software, so just really want to just emphasize that there's, we're now moving to a completely different approach. Okay, so we said uh, at the beginning of formal methods has been going uh, 40 odd years. I could, have, I could have gone back earlier, I could have gone back hundreds of years, if you like, depending on what your definition of formal methods is, but I thought let's take uh, 1970 as a good starting point. So around the 70s we had VDM, uh, X machines. The reason I mention X machines is, is if you look in the literature, there has been uh, work on uh, using X machines in an agile, agile approach. So that's that's why I flagged that one there. Zed, Jonathan Bowen as well. Those I've mentioned before. Grandfather of Zed. Uh, kill me when he sees this video. Uh, so around 1977, and also had CSP as well, which was also uh, has, has been very influential in the formal methods area. B as well uh, is very has been very influential, and of course uh, designed by contract, and of course the I4 language has been very very influential too. Uh, I mentioned Alloy next, uh, developed by Daniel Jackson, because we've at the introduction we talked about lightweight formal methods. So Alloy is a is a really good example of uh, a lightweight approach, and is itself if you like, uh, an agile formal method. Um, Circus, which um, is, is an example of combining CSP and Z. So I wanted to show here that people have taken kind of like two different formal methods, combined them together to kind of get uh, something which is the greatest than the sum of their parts. And there was a conference in 2003 which addressed formal methods and agile, so I thought it would be worth putting that on the timeline. So, as I said, this, this timeline is, is not complete, but I hope I got my data right and it is actually sound. Right, so, okay, so now we've got some examples of some formal methods success <coughs> stories. Just to kind of contrast, we had some agile success story. So, in no real particular order, I, I wanted to talk a little <coughs> bit, um, just a few sentences, because I'm sure other speakers will talk about this as well. It's just Mondex, I think, is a, is a really good uh, example of uh, where formal methods has really helped. Uh, so this was an uh, electronic money device like smart cards where it um, achieved insect level six and there was like, I think it was like 200 page document of Z and this was all done um, by hand if you like, the proofs were done manually but since, <coughs> but since then uh, tools have been used to verify uh, the various proof conditions and also other people in other formal methods communities have come together and they've applied their approach to the same problem. So it's been a real great success story, I think, for formal methods. Uh, so Airbus, I think we're going to hear about a little bit later on as well, so I won't mention that just now. That's Paris Metro, I thought it would be appropriate to mention that. So uh, example of using the B method, and that's, and that's been a very good success story too. Uh, the Inmos transputer, once again, um, as I mentioned CSP earlier on, so we had uh, the language Occam being developed uh, and uses of Z as well. This is meant to be the uh, mysterious air traffic control system, which we'll hear some more about, no doubt. So, uh, but this, this is, I, I believe, going to be another su great success story of formal methods. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so I wasn't quite expecting that to happen, but fortunately, Microsoft has been very proactive and has developed uh, the SLAM tool to actually capture these kind of blue screen situations where, because it's like the drivers interacting with Windows in an inappropriate way. So, thank you, Microsoft. I think it's, they've been proactive rather than just kind of uh, let people win shit continuously. <coughs> I don't work for Microsoft, by the way. <laughs> Okay, we've got another quiz. So I'm not sure how many people are going to get this PlayStation 3, but we'll see. Okay, so we've got three statements. 
think you can probably guess that's the correct <laughs> one. Although I might as well get the train back. So, uh, uh, anybody think that the uh, the first one is uh, is a true statement? There we go. So uh, I I agree with with that person in the front row. So <laughs> I shall continue my uh, my talk. So formal methods and agile can can actually coexist. And so what's more, we do. I think the two work well together, and they actually need one another. So. You remember so, uh, I showed you these things, uh, the Agile, uh, why Agile is not suitable for uh, like all software development. And what I'm going to do now is to visit each of those in turn and show how we can, how formal methods can help. All right, so I suppose one question is probably an easy question or obvious question, why, why we need documentation? Well. Whether you like it or not, I mean, there's a lot of code out there, and you do have to maintain it. Uh, I mean, people working in the software industry know that you know often when you when someone starts as a developer, the first thing they're given is uh, all the bugs to go and fix. You know, it's a good it's a good way of testing uh, testing someone's stamina and whether they can cut the mustard. So, but without documentation, you can't. It's not very easy to fix bugs, and not very easy to actually understand what a system's supposed to do. So you need to maintain systems, so you do need documentation for that. And whether you like it or not, some systems will be in operation for decades. So we saw this with uh, when the Y2K problem was about, when there were systems very old that were still performing key functions and you have to, you have to maintain them. They're there, why rewrite them? They work. Also, uh, an important feature as well is you have to be able to transfer the knowledge to other people you work with. So, I mean, peerwise programming is, is good in uh, in principle, but it can be negative in the sense that uh, you have uh, knowledge in silos. So, you've got two people, they know how it works. Okay, you can rotate the team. So, all that team know how it works, but then suddenly someone leaves. So that new person has to be trained up, and if you've got like a tight schedule, uh, you haven't got time to really train the person that much. They just have to try and learn as they go along. So it's much easier if you actually got some some kind of documentation in place. So I mentioned early on on that timeline about design by contract. So I think design by contract uh, can help uh, significantly here. And there's already been some good success stories with people using design by contract. But by writing some uh, preconditions and postconditions, you can convey the intent. Of, uh, of what a function is supposed to do. And so somebody reading that can actually understand what, what, was, what it's supposed to do. And so it's not too much of an onus on the developer because you're doing some good things anyway because you can automatically check these uh, contracts. So you're getting uh, two for the price of one, if you like. Retrospectively generating loop invariants is another thing you can do, and that can actually help with the documentation effort as well. And as I said, you can check these uh, automatically. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, the other thing we're talking about is writing, writing tests. So I mentioned on an earlier slide uh, about <coughs> test-driven development. So somebody writes a test, the test fails, they change the code, test now passes. <coughs> you continue that cycle over and over again 